that high protein first thing in the morning tends to lead to less hunger over the course of the day. If you wanna make sure that you've got your hunger levels in check so that you can focus on other things and that you're not you know, predisposing your body to undo weight gain, you really do wanna focus on, on eating a high protein breakfast. How much protein per day should a person be consuming? Um, Here. What a treat. Welcome to the Commune Podcast. How you doing, Jeff? What's going on? It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm doing really great. I'm on a nice little on-ramp, I guess I would say. And, you know, I've been listening a lot to your podcast um, and really, really enjoying it. Um, and, uh, you know, we're both kind of curious guys and we keep abreast of the various different trends and we're listening and talking to a lot of health experts all the time. And one theme that seems to be kind of creaming to the top of a lot of these conversations is the importance of muscle. Hmm. And I listened to a number of conversations on your podcast, and I, I really highly recommend that everybody does. I think you were talking to Thomas DeLauer, to, um, what's the guy, Ted Naiman? Is that, is that Ted Naiman? <laughs> he's, he's great, yes. Yeah. Um, but then, like, particularly with women... So I know our friend Gabrielle Lyon has her new book coming out, this kind of which focus on muscle centric medicine. I know you talked to JJ Virgin recently. Um, and I know that you've been hitting the gym and focused on what I think what you often talk about is body recomposition. Yes. Um, which I think is a really very good way of looking at it. So maybe we'll just kind of start high level. Um, wh why is muscle so important? Yeah, that is a fantastic place to start. I think I think the reason why it's definitely worth talking about, especially today, um, because when you zoom out and look at the problems that are mainly affecting public health today, they are characterized in no small part by metabolic dysfunction. Um, and metabolic dysfunction today, particularly in the context of the standard American diet, is sometimes referred to as energy toxicity. Like people tend to be, the, the modern milieu is one such that the average person today is overfed, undernourished, and underactive. And so a lot of people today are struggling with chronically elevated blood sugar, um, but even prior to that, chronically elevated insulin. You see other indicators of metab metabolic impairment um, such as, for example, low levels of HDL. You see lots of visceral adiposity, so that's visceral fat, fat in the midsection that is particularly particularly egregious from the standpoint of health. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. And lo and behold, age-related chronic disease rates are skyrocketing. I'm particularly interested in, in brain health, but you know, a lot of people, as they get older, you see this, this epidemic of frailty, um, and so I think when you ask the question of how do we, how do we begin to unravel like this sorry state of affairs that we're in, I think it kind of, and this is what the research is, is starting to show. And thankfully we have a lot of champions now that are sounding this, this alarm. It all kind of comes back to muscle at the end of the day. Muscle, muscle is the antidote for the problems associated with the Western diet and lifestyle, um, you know, there's no better way to encourage whole body insulin sensitivity than resistance training. And it's also all of the factors that we know that go into uh, supporting your skeletal muscle that also seem to really play an important role. I was just reading a new crossover study that came out or uh, that I saw shared earlier today that compared um, a, a, a quote unquote high protein diet with the Mediterranean diet, which is the Mediterranean diet is often lauded as being the hallmark healthful diet mm -hmm. to prevent age related chronic disease. And this high protein diet wasn't even, um, I mean, it was only moderately higher in protein as uh, in terms of the protein percentage as compared to the Mediterranean diet. But we saw even a 10% increase in protein, um, as a, as a proportion of calories was associated with improvements in insulin resistance. So, 
And, you know, we know that protein is the best macronutrient to support your musculature. So whenever we kind of like look at health through this lens, it seems to be, it seems to be the biggest needle mover. Um, and that's why I think it's so exciting because it's actually a, it's, it's a very simple recommendation as well. Yeah. I, I'm so glad that you built that bridge between muscle hypertrophy and metabolic health because it, it's not obvious uh, to most people. Like, you know, what does, uh, you know, putting on additional lean muscle have to do with my blood glucose levels or my insulin sensitivity? Unless you kind of start to pry these things apart, you wouldn't necessarily immediately make that connection. Um, but that connection is, is completely direct and, you know, just even product of my own personal experience. Um, I was pre-diabetic. I talk about that on the show quite a bit. It wasn't even that long ago, maybe four, three and a half, four years ago now. Um, wow. you know, kind of my initial window into that was to put on a CGM, hmm. um, you know, because, and that just gave me transparency into at least one metric, which was, you know, chronically high fasting glucose levels. So I was at about 125, 130 milligrams per deciliter fasting. So it's pretty high. Um, and so then I adopted a whole bunch of different protocols to obviously lower that. Um, and then of course, as you mentioned, upstream from the glucose levels is insulin. So you know, if my blood glucose, fasting blood glucose levels were there, my, my fasting insulin, my insulin levels were probably kind of off the chart at that juncture. Um, but the great news is that a lot of this stuff, if you get it, if you get at it is reversible. So I adopted a whole bunch of different protocols, but where I really saw the huge decrease in my fasting blood glucose levels is when I started to focus more on protein and resistance training. Mm. And, um, and it turns out that, like you said, that, that muscle is like a metabolic or a glucose sink, right? Yeah. You know, it's, um, hey, can you get, maybe get a, into that maybe with a little bit more depth? Cause I know this is something that you know a lot about. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, your, your body is sort of like, uh, when it comes to your capacity to store glucose, which is sugar, um, your body is sort of like a, a studio apartment in New York City. There's just not many places to cram that additional sugar. You've got your liver, which can store, depending on body size, 100, 125 grams of sugar in the form of glycogen. But it's your musculature. And you're, by the way, your liver doesn't grow, right? So what you, the, your musculature is the other place in which you can store sugar, also in the form of glycogen. But your muscle can grow, and you, you grow it via hypertrophic stimulus, as you alluded to, which is resistance training. Now, if you were living in one of these so-called blue zones, and I have a bone to pick actually with the way that blue zones are marketed, but just you know, for the yeah. sake of conversation, the blue zones are these communities around the world that are purported to have very exceptionally long-lived people. They're highly active. Um, they eat minimally processed diets. And they actually do eat a significant proportion of protein. And when you're active all day, your body is using that stored sugar. And we've seen this from studies where, you know, even a five-minute walk after a meal reduces post-meal blood sugar, post-prandial blood sugar, right? So being active is a way to, um, to reduce that blood sugar. But again, in the context of the standard American diet where we're minimally active, we're chronically sedentary, you need places to stuff that sugar, and your musculature is really the best way to do that. And we were talking about insulin, chronically elevated insulin. Hyperinsulinemia is a huge problem. When you're active, just muscle contraction stimulates the uptake of glucose from your blood. It, crea it turns your muscles essentially into a sponge, and you benefit from what's called insulin-independent in glucose uptake. So movement right. is crucially important, and, and again, supporting your musculature, making sure that you're you know, robust in strength is a, is a really great way to make sure that you're keeping your blood sugar levels healthy. Because again, your muscles are where you store, where you can store that sugar. And the other thing is you want to use the sugar that's being stored in your muscles. So you want to perform on a regular basis, high intensity glycolytic anaerobic activity. Those are all big words, but essentially what that, that I, I use those terms to, dis, to differentiate resistance training from just staying active, which I think a lot of people get the advice, very nonspecific advice to just stay active. When you're walking around um, or even going on a, a light hike, which is 
obviously going to be incredibly good for you. It's a form of aerobic cardiovascular exercise. You're not using that stored sugar. That stored sugar stays in your muscles until they're burnt off via higher intensity exercise. And resistance training is a perfect example of that. And the only, um, you only use the sugar that's stored in the muscle that you're using. So for example, if you're doing really intense curls, you're not using any of the stored sugar that's stored in your legs. So you wanna make sure that you're regularly um, strength training and you wanna make sure that you're strength training all of the major muscle groups in your body. Hmm. That's such a great point. Um, and I think you know you alluded to it is that muscles don't actually require insulin to uptake glucose when they're contracting. So that's uh, just even as if we need more reasons yeah. <laughs> you know, to, uh, um, but maybe let's bridge over to cognitive health because I know this is such a focus uh, of your work. It, it seems more and more that neurodegenerative diseases um, like Alzheimer's and dementia are, are, are metabolic in their origin. I know, I'm sure you've talked to guys like Chris Palmer, uh, who wrote a book called Brain, Emer Brain Energy. Yeah. And there was another book that came out that really addressed this head on. I can't remember right now. I probably need to do some more resistance. <laughs> <laughs> um, but can you uh, make that link a little bit between, you know, metabolic health and brain health, if you don't mind? Yeah, so the brain is the most metabolically hungry organ in the body. Despite accounting for only 2 to 3% of your body's mass, accounts for 25% of your basal metabolic rate. So 25% of all the food that you eat, 25% of every breath you take is going to support energy creation in the brain, where the brain is a ravenous energy consumer. And... We're starting to see that the same way that the body, that there can be essentially gridlock in the body with regard to energy uh, generation, the same thing can occur in the brain. And in fact, does seem to occur in the brain in pathological states such as Alzheimer's disease, which is sort of like the worst possible brain health outcome, right? So in the Alzheimer's riddle brain, the brain the brain's ability to create energy from glucose, which is its primary energy substrate, is diminished by about 50%, which, mm -hmm. again, you know, just kind of underscoring how important energy is for the brain. It's not, a, it's not happenstance that the brain j is responsible for 25% of your basal metab metabolic rate. It's like the, the, whole, the body has evolved to walk the brain around, essentially. It is, in a way, the most important <laughs> organ in the body. Yeah. And it's incredibly energy-hungry. And so, you know, any, any impairment in the brain's ability to create energy is going to create problems. And we actually see there are brain scans that suggest that people who are genetically predisposed to developing, al developing Alzheimer's disease actually have a very slight uh, reduction in their ability to generate glucose from across the age spectrum. Hmm. And so how do we prevent Alzheimer's disease? Well, it seems that the body's... Uh, overall metabolic health is related to the metabolic health of the brain, um, which kind of makes intuitive sense, but of course it's always good to have data. And so we see that the degree of insulin resistance in the body is actually related quite strongly to the degree of um, what's referred to as glucose hypometabolism in the brain. Right. And this is to the degree that Alzheimer's disease is now being referred to by some as type 3 diabetes, a form of diabetes of the brain. So it's really important. You know, all the pieces are still being put together. The brain uses insulin, but in ways that are different than, the, than perhaps the, the periphery. So we're, we're still trying to piece all the, all the parts together. But um, there are some studies that indicate that, you know, when you supply the brain with an alternate fuel source, such as ketones, ketone bodies, um, whether by way of nutritional ketosis from a ketogenic diet or, uh, you know, with these sort of ketogenic supplements that there's in, in and particularly earlier in um, the progression of Alzheimer's disease, there seems to be a cognitive, a very like slight cognitive improvement. Um, and what ketones are doing is ketones are supplying energy to the brain. So it seems that there's this energetic, you know, to, to, you, to borrow Chris Palmer's um, 
uh, catchphrase, brain energy problem with regard to Alzheimer's disease. And this is actually something that, that I spotlighted in my book, you know, five years ago in, in Genius Foods. Um, and so, yeah, we, we definitely want to uh, be mindful of the metabolic health of the body. And today, about 9 in 10 adults have some component of metabolic illness. So it's just a crazy, you know, sad situation. And I think the, you know, it's not, it's the standard American food diet, which I think plays a large role in this, but it's also the, the lifestyle. You know, we're chronically stressed, we're chronically underslept, we're chronically sedentary. Um, none of these things are, are positive from the standpoint of metabolic health. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've talked to Ben Bickman. I, I assume you probably have, but he has done a lot in, in, in to study uh, hippocampal tissue in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. Mm. And what he was finding is exactly what you just outlined, is that there's essentially in hippocampal cells, they become insulin resistant. Um, so there's, a, there's basically glucose metabolism dysfunction that's happening there. But then accompanying that is hyperinsulinemia, so high levels of insulin, and with high levels of insulin, your body's not going to produce the ketones. So mm. your brain is basically just doesn't have either substrate available to it. So what's it going to do? It's going to start to contract. And so this is, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, dementia rates that are just like off the charts right now. Um, so yeah. It's a big deal. It's a, it's a huge deal. I mean, if you are, and just to put sort of statistics to this, if you're a type 2 diabetic, your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease increases between two and fourfold. So you are at the very least doubling your risk for the development of Alzheimer's disease if you're a type two diabetic. And so many people today are struggling from type two diabetes, pre-diabetes. The majority of people with pre-diabetes don't even know that they have it. Um, right. And so it's a, yeah, it's a huge public health problem. There you go. I was one of them. Yeah, I was one of them. Um, yeah, you brought up a term the core metabolic rate at, at one juncture. And I, I think it's important to maybe unpack that for people because uh, obviously the development of muscle helps to increase that core metabolic rate where you're just like literally just sitting around watching mm -hmm. Curb Your Enthusiasm. You're, you're burning more calories mm -hmm. if you have more muscle than you otherwise would be. Um, can you unpack core metabolic rate for us? Yeah. So your you know, your, your body has a, to maintain what's called homeostasis, your body has a, a just a, a general burn rate um, at which it goes through energy. And just sitting on your couch, no matter who you are, you're burning a certain amount of calories just to s sustain the many processes that are occurring in your body, um, which we call whole life. You know, you're a living, breathing entity. Okay. Things are happening. Um, even when, yes, you're just sitting on the couch watching Curb Your Enthusiasm reruns. <laughs> Uh, which I've done, which I've spent many nights <laughs> yeah. doing. I know. I should total, I, I need an Excel sheet on how many calories I've burned watching Larry <laughs> David stuff and shit. I mean, I'm sure laughing, laughing, burn, you know, increases that calorie <laughs> significantly. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you don't really have, you know, there are, there are a few ways to increase your metabolic rate. Having more muscle in your body is one of them. It's not a huge margin. Um, and it's difficult, you know, muscle accrual, particularly for the person who's been training, a trained individual, it's pretty difficult to do, which is why, you know, I hear women still, and this is thankfully becoming less of a concern um, at the population level, but women, you know, there's this concern that resistance training is going to make them bulky, um, which is not the case. I mean, getting, <laughs> I've been training for 30 years at this point, and uh, I'm trying to get bulk, like I'm still tr trying to chase you know, <laughs> gains every day. Right. It's just not easy, you know? Um, but yes, yeah, so with, with building muscle, muscle is a meta, is a very um, energy expensive tissue. Uh, and it, it, it burns calories just sitting on your body. And this is one of the reasons why in, you know, when you are sedentary and you're in a calorie deficit. So if you actually are on bed rest and you're not eating, muscle wasting is a massive concern because muscle is incredibly energy expensive. It's like the first, it's the first tissue to go really. If your body thinks that you're at risk of starving to death. Yeah. I think it was on your podcast that I heard. Um, so we, we hear about sarcopenia, sort of the, the loss of muscle mass. And I think that's 10% every decade. So on average, maybe 1% a year, but, um, you know, after a fall, let's say if you're not able to like grab something and support yourself, 
and you fall and, you know, heaven forbid, break a hip or sustain some other form of injury, I think it was on your podcast that I hear you could lose like two pounds of muscle per week mm. in that bed rest period. And that is really significant. Yeah, I don't remember the exact um, figures, but it is a it's a real concern. And, that, and, and conversely, I think it's important for people to know that resistance training with adequately intense stimulus is the best way to preserve muscle, to keep muscle when in a calorie deficit. So a lot of people who are looking mm. to lose weight today, which is a, a noble goal, you know, I mean, today we're trending towards one in two people being ob not just overweight, but obese. You know, losing losing fat is an incredibly worthwhile goal, I think, for most people. And even if you're not overweight, um, you know, aesthetics matter, I think. And so, you know, some people might want to want to lose a little bit of, bit of fat before the next uh, bathing suit season. And so um, I think no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your health journey, it's really important to note that whether you're in a that if you're in a calorie deficit, which is a catabolic state when you're burning more calories on a 24 hour period than you're ingesting resistance training giving your muscles adequate anabolic stimulus with resistance training is the best way to signal to your body that we need to hold on to the muscle right mm -hmm. whereas um inactivity bed rest for example while being in a in a catabolic state a calorie deficit is your body's gonna get rid of the muscle because it's so energy expensive yeah i think this is one of the concerns around some of these semi-glutide yes. drugs like Ozempic is that, I mean, it's kind of early days, so we don't really have our thumb on the data 100%, but it seems like that weight loss, um, Ozempic-induced weight loss, seems to catabolize a lot of muscle. Um, and uh, obviously, there's probably some some noble uses of it in cases that are quite acute. Mm -hmm. Um, but just as a general practice, it seems like there is this tension, um, there between weight loss, um, well, healthy weight loss, you know, and I think it actually has to do more with the framing, which I think you've been so good at is that maybe we shouldn't really worry as much about being overweight. We should really reframe the conversation as being under muscled. Um, because it's not really the weight loss per se all the time. It's really just the lack of, of muscle. Yeah, so many people. I mean, non uh, normal weight metabolic obesity um, is a real thing. In fact, that's probably what you suffered from, right? Because you've never, I mean, I've known you for years and I've never, I would never take you at least from, a, from an optics standpoint to be somebody suffering from metabolic illness, but clearly that's, you were. And so... I think this is a, yeah, I mean, f you can... Well, I wore baggy shirts. <laughs> <laughs> you can I had be... like I had like dad bod underneath, wow. you know? Yeah, so that, I yeah. mean, you were skinny fat, essentially, what that, yeah. which is what that is. You were, you were under-muscled, you were, you were over-fat. That's, I mean, that is right there. That's the, that's the archetype. And so that is, I mean, you're welcoming in metabolic illness by, um, by being under-muscled. And that, you know, that clearly... Is illustrates right there why weight is not the end all be all because by beginning a resistance training regimen, particularly if you're under trained or if you've detrained, you will gain weight. You'll you will likely gain weight. You'll see the scale inch upwards, but that's like healthy weight because you're in that setting. You're putting on muscle, um, and that's super super important. Yeah. Um... One more attribute of muscle to extol before we uh, maybe explore how we actually put it on. Um, I've been hearing more and more about muscle as an endocrine as an endocrine organ, so as a sort of producer of hormones or, or, or molecules like myokines. Yeah. I don't really know what those do or what they are. I've heard them framed as like hope molecules. And <laughs> there's a, a bunch of like some woo woo around it. I don't know. Do you have any sense of you know, from an endocrine perspective, if muscle is useful? Yeah, I mean, there, there are countless hormones and myokines. And, you know, I certainly don't, I, I couldn't name them all. Um, I don't know anybody who could. But myo is the, the suffix myo means muscle. Kines are basically like, you've heard of cytokines, signaling molecules in the body. 
And so mm-hmm. when you're contracting your muscle, when you're building muscle, your muscles are releasing certain chemicals into, um, into circulation. And one myokine that I am familiar with because of its role in brain health is BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor, which actually is released by muscle. And I believe can cross the blood brain barrier where um, it acts sort of like a miracle grow protein in the brain, but also even in periphery, I mean, you know, you have like nerve nerves, right. Running throughout your body. Right. BDNF is a, is a protein that literally it exists to its role is to support the uh, survival of existing neurons and to promote the growth of new ones. So it's, again, it's like this miracle grow protein that we see is stimulated by all types of exercise. We used to think that it was primarily aerobic exercise, but now we're starting to see data um, to support that it's uh, also released with resistance training, which is fantastic. Mm. Yeah. And it's so encouraging also because for decades we were told that the brain basically just goes into decline at age 25. You know, you can't make any more neurons and you're just sort of doomed to this kind of limping through the last (laughs) half century of your life. But now with kind of neuroplasticity, um, we're learning that, yeah, you actually not, not only can you maintain optimal neural activity, but it seems like you can actually grow new neurons, um, particularly through, through BDNF. So that's amazing. Yeah. And BDNF is, is also, um, compromised in, uh, disease states like Alzheimer's disease, where I believe it's also reduced. Um, well, I know it's reduced and, uh, and also depression, which is very interesting. I think by about 50%, according to some, um, indices. So yeah, so BDNF is thought to be this highly benevolent, uh, growth protein protein that's primarily stimulated with exercise. I think there are some nutrients that can also stimulate it like DHA fat. Um, right. but yeah, exercise is, is probably the best way. Yeah. I think sauna perhaps hmm. maybe just in its exercise mimicking properties. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then of course there's just like the pure performance element of having more muscle. Like it's so much more fun for me to go to a yoga class. My wife's been a yoga teacher for 35 years. I used to assiduously avoid her class (laughs) because I couldn't do half the shit that she would do. And then, you know, I started doing a hundred pull-ups a day, a hundred pushups a day, a hundred sit-ups a day. That's just kind of my baseline. And then I would go to yoga class and all all of a sudden I'd be like popping into these things, you know, that I never thought, you know, and and to obviously move and support your own body weight, it just feels from a performance perspective so good. So there's just really every reason in the world to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I definitely have a bias for resistance training. I think I'm, uh, I think I've been for the majority of my adult life, a closet meathead. Um, and I've, I've (laughs) just only recently started to out myself <laughs> yeah as uh as such and um and i and i really enjoy it i mean i really enjoy the i i think like the human body is so ma- malleable you know and I, and i think it's once you start once you engage with a resistance training regimen and you start to really understand just how malleable the body is with mm. patience with discipline with consistency with all the things that you you know that you need because it's like you know, to some degree, it is like watching a plant grow. It's only, you know, when you're able to step back and, and for example, uh, look at old photos of yourself, do you really see the stark progress that you're able to make? Um, I think it's incredible. And there's a spillover effect. I mean, it just like affects every other aspect of your life when you realize, you know, just how much control you have um, over your body, how you feel, how you look, your confidence. It affects your mental health in such profound ways. That, um, that I think it really is, I mean, it's like my, I think it's one of the greatest things in life, you know? I mean, people say that sex, food, maybe a good night's sleep. I mean, I would put a good workout and, and just the general progress of seeing yourself acclimate and adapt to high-intensity uh, resistance training. I think it's up there with one of the best things, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I mean, one thing that you said there is that, you know, we are malleable. Like we just talked about how for decades we used to think that the brain was just like fixed, you yeah. know. Oh, shit. After 25, we're kind of fucked, you know. And we used to think that about our genes, too. There was, you know, 50 years of genetic determinism. And, you know, since 1953, when Watson and Crick 
you know, entered mm-hmm. the Eagle Pub and they were like, we did it, we figured it out. And then we spent 50 years trying to, you know, map the genome and figure out how every gene related to every disease, et cetera, you know, such that then, you know, we could, you know, figure out how to alter our fates. You know, the fates were already written in the, our fate was written in the stars or something. But I think the last 20 years, which is so exciting, is that, you know, with the microbiome, with the epigenetics, with neuroplasticity, that we've learned that we are completely impermanent, malleable beings. Like you said it, you look at a photo, you know, of yourself three years ago or 20 years ago, you know, you're not the same person. You're just a process. You're always <laughs> evolving in relation to your environment. And you have a good amount of agency in, in that process. So it's, it's, it's awesome. And I think the other thing you were pointing to, which I get stoked about is like the upward spiral. Like we, we, we hear often about downward health spirals, but you know, when you hit the gym, there can be this like upward spiral where it starts to like punctuate all these other parts of your life. And yeah. Awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. I mean, I was, I watched the, uh, there's a new Netflix series documenting Arnold Schwarzenegger's life. And, um, yeah, you know, in in more vulgar language, he said basically that a good pump is better than sex. Uh, in his in his view, I don't know if your listeners are going to necessarily uh, agree to that extent, but um, but for me, having a having a good workout and celebrating in the gym what my body can do, especially as a f- like forty one year old and and looking and being in better shape and having a more aesthetic physique than you know people that are 10, 20 years younger than me in in, in the gym that I go to. Um, is a, it's an incredible feeling. And so, you know, and then having a diet that I know, f- a, a, a diet that's evidence-based to support the effort that I put in in the gym, a, a high-protein diet, um, it just, it's the best feeling ever. I just know that I'm, yeah, I, uh, you know, and and it, and all the research, it's these aren't just short-term, this isn't just for short-term gratification, right? It's like we know... Yeah. Now all the research is converging to show us that the same things that you can do that are going to give you a more aesthetic body, a more confident stature um, in the gym, and of course with a diet to support that, also is going to help procure your longevity in accordance with the best available evidence. So it's just an incredible, incredible thing. And once all that, I think, clicks for your average person, which it does take a bit of a click because it's, it's not always the most intuitive thing to be able to piece together, but it really is a... a powerfully empowering um insight yeah 100 percent. oh this is what i'm on my dad about all the time he's 81 and i'm like dad you know just go to the gym you don't have to do anything crazy but just a few times a week you know with yeah. something come on yeah um older yeah. older adults get this advice to just stay active and i think it's le- you know it leads you see a lot of people on hikes with their walking sticks and they're walking and it's, that's amazing right so keep doing that but um, there is this sort of, and I think for older generations in particular, there's uh, the resistance training is this underappreciated, perhaps fringe um, interest. You know, public gyms only really became a thing in the past, I mean, 40 years, 50 years. Uh, I know that my parents never, resistance training was never a part of their lives. And so it's something that I think is just really important and, um, and still underappreciated amongst particular, especially older adults. Yeah. I think Jack LaLanne busted it open just a few, like a mile from where we both live, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> more or less. I love that. And, um, so let's segue to diet. So, you know, on your Instagram, I think you have posted as your number one post kind of the 10 top things that you learned after 300 podcast interviews. I think I, I know you're probably like more like 390 or something like that now. It's incredible. Um, but I think number two or three was protein is king. So what is the role of protein in muscle and what's the best way to get it? So protein is basically, it's one of the three major macronutrients. Um, you have protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And Protein is, uh, differentiate, is differentiated from carbohydrates and fat in the sense that carbohydrates and fat are essentially energy. Um, and protein is not easily utilized by your body as energy because it's a building block. So it's an essential macronutrient because it, it actually is a building block for your body. It's not just uh, supportive of your musculature. 
when protein breaks down into its constituent amino acids, I mean, amino acids form the backbone precursors to your neurotransmitters like serotonin, like dopamine, like acetylcholine, which is important for learning and memory. Um, it, it creates enzymes, all the myriad chemicals that it takes to make your body run. I mean, you are, you are chemistry at the end of the day, and amino acids are crucially important. And of course, energy helps that system run. It provides the fuel. But um, so that's, that's the role that protein plays in the body. And it's so important, in fact, that it's believed that our hunger mechanisms, like the, the, the drive that we have hardwired into the hypothalamus, like the most primordial region of the brain that exists in every organism to consume food, to ingest food, is driven um, in large part by our requirement for amino acids. It's referred to as the protein leverage hypothesis. So we see that people who undereat protein tend to leverage their food environment to get those amino acids by consuming more carbohydrates and fat. And circling back to where we started this conversation, we live in a time of widespread energy toxicity. And so just to underscore the fact that carbohydrates and fat are energy, we don't need to be eating more energy, right? Most of us. This is not a um, recommendation, you know, I mean, obviously there there is individual variation here, but for the most part, the majority of us, we're energy replete, right? And so by using protein for its uh, satiety inducing effects, it's a powerful way to get your hunger under control. So that's one, right? So we know that when we eat more protein, we tend to consume less carbohydrates and fat, and that protein isn't easily utilized by your body as an energy source. It's just too expensive. Your body needs it to build muscle, and there's that. And to that end, you also get a bit of a caloric free ride when you ingest protein. About 30% of the calories that you ingest by way of protein are burnt off via the digestion and assimilation of protein in and of itself. So you get about, right. you know, it's well known at this point, I think, that protein has four calories per gram, so do carbohydrates, and fat has nine calories per gram. But in actuality, you're only, the yield um, of calories per gram um, with regard to protein is only generally about three calories per gram because it, right. it burns off a calorie just in the, in the digestion alone. We also see that um, high-protein foods, like protein-containing foods, tend to be rich in other micronutrients. Um, this was a study published by Stuart Phillips, who's a protein expert, um, I think from McMaster University in Canada. Um, I could be wrong there, but this the study basically found that high protein foods were also rich in other really important micronutrients. So it's not just protein that we're ingesting when we consume high protein foods. And yeah, protein is protein provides the building blocks of your muscle tissue, particularly the amino acid leucine which is the sort of key gatekeeper on um, what's called muscle protein synthesis. So when we talk about how important it is to create muscle, all of the essential amino acids are important, um, but it's leucine that is sort of the rate-limiting amino acid that we get um, in high-quality protein. And so the highest-quality proteins that uh, exist in the food supply are, by and large, animal proteins. So apologies to anybody on plant-based diets who are listening, but, um, you know, it's, it's cut and dry at this point, non-controversial that animal proteins are the highest, uh, quality proteins. Now I will say that when you're consuming adequate protein, um, the protein quality issue, uh, is less important. So, you know, if you're consuming adequate protein, it ultimately from a muscle protein synthesis standpoint, doesn't matter so much where you're getting your protein from. But when you look at the population level, vegans and vegetarians do tend to consume less protein and as a result have less muscle mass um, than omnivores. So, and also older, older adult populations tend to under consume protein. So for people, uh, for people no matter you know, where on the age spectrum you are, under consuming protein, when you under consume protein, protein quality does matter. And you start, and you see that animal protein is the highest quality protein, with maybe you know very close behind, if not on equal footing. You see now that soy has a has a pretty good amino acid profile and um, also relatively high digestibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, people have seen the documentary Game Changers. You know, yeah. people bring that up 
uh, often, or there's, you know, guys like Simon Hill who are, are devout vegans. But my, the asterisk I always put next to that is that, yes, but these people are essentially high performance athletes. Yeah. They are spending their life focused on getting all of the essential amino acids from a plant-based diet. And that is, if you have the time and the knowledge to pinpoint how to do that, that constellation of foods and able to, in, in order to get enough protein, God bless. Right. But, um, but for the population at large, yeah. um, I think, you know, your point is very, very well taken. It's just the, the bioavailability of protein, um, in, in, in animals, is just going to be higher. And so this is actually kind of what I, I want to ask you, cause I, because I think, you know, there's these trends that kind of come up in the in the zeitgeist of like, you know, it was like no fat for a really long time. <laughs> right. And then it was, you know, um, and then it was no carbs. Um, but it seems like that that fat now that that if, if we're looking for the highest quality of protein while also maintaining the right level of energy balance and calorie intake that we want to look for more like lean cuts of meat, for example, stuff that doesn't have a ton of fat on it. Is, does that, does that come into your reasoning? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think, um, there is, you know, society tends to overcorrect with everything. And I think that the demonization yeah. of fat over the past, uh, few decades has led to, and it was an unwarranted demonization at the, essentially at the dawn of nutrition science. It just, you know, was this very seductive narrative to sell to the public and even healthcare professionals that fat made you fat, that saturated fats clogged your arteries the same way that they do a drain. Um, but we know that our biology is much more complex than uh, simple plumbing. And so, and so society has, has sort of overcorrected where, you know, over the past couple of years, we've seen the rise of, um, you know, uh, th this sort of zeal surrounding dietary approaches like the keto diet and the low carb diet, where suddenly now I think people have believe have wrongfully believed that fat calories are essentially a free ride. Um, and that, you know, there's really no downside of over consuming saturated fat. Um, and I think, you know, as with most things, the truth tends to be sort of in the middle, you know, you have to kind of keep your horse blinders on, especially today and avoid the zealots on both sides of the, of the aisle, because the truth really does seem to be somewhere in the middle. And I do think there's an argument to be made for lean protein, um, being, uh, healthier. And I think, you know, for me, this has always been the case and something I wrote about in my first book. Um, I didn't, I don't even feel like I need science to, to make this recommendation. Um, it's it, logic really. I mean, I think is all you need to realize that, uh, the, a modern cow is incredibly fatty, particularly when compared to wild game, which is the form of, um, you know, uh, meat that we would have likely consumed for the majority of our, of our evolution. Also, when you take a modern cow and you feed it its biologically appropriate diet, i.e. grass, it's leaner. So that indicates um, the relative you know, fatty acid uh, proportion that I think you're meant to consume. The fact that you feed a cow, it's, uh, which is a domesticated animal, it's, aber it's biologically, a biologically aberrant diet, and it becomes so fatty. Um, why, we're not adapted to consume ruminant animals fed biologically aberrant diets. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think there's absolutely an argument to be made for lean, um, you know, for lean meat. And by the way, when you say lean meat, we're not saying fat free, like even lean, uh, like a New York strip steak or which, you know, I love or uh, filet mignon, they still contain adequate fat. You're still getting adequate fat. Like nobody is deficient in fat today in the context of the standard American diet. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a, I, I think eating lean meat is, is great, particularly, particularly if you have fat to lose from your body, there's no need to, to overdo the added fat. If you have fat on your body that you'd like to lose. Right. I mean, excess calories that aren't burned still get stored 
in fat re- in adipocytes in fat repositories. Yeah. No matter if they come from carbs or if they come from from fatty acids, and I think we got a little bit lost in in the woods there for a minute because we were so worried about carbs and its impact on insulin right. and the sort of hormonal argument for for weight gain that we lost the old thermodynamics you know calories in calories out argument and it turns out i think that both are true to some yeah. level um and again you know you sort of find your middle way eventually but it, it's hard with the zealots you're right yeah no it's really difficult um yeah, and actually fat is the most easily stored as fat. And whatever right, whatever yeah. dietary fat you eat, you're going to burn that off first before you tap into your own fat silos. So I think, you know, and I, and I personally experienced this earlier in the year. I did a little bit of, of a fat loss experiment. And um, opting mainly for uh, lean meat and cutting out, the majority of added fats, so for even fats from healthful oils and butter and things like that, uh, I, I reduced it all dramatically, and I saw the fat. I saw fat on my own body just come off effortlessly. Now you still need to ingest adequate fat to support hormone synthesis, um, and saturated fats play an important role there. You still need fat to facilitate digestion. Um, that's crucially important. Also the absorption of many fat soluble nutrients whether they're essential nutrients like the fat soluble vitamins or even compounds plant compounds that we know are fat soluble like um, carotenoids uh, are Mm. super important to eye health and brain health you need fat to do that job to uh, absorb those nutrients but that being and of course omega-3 fatty acids are really important and essential um, but beyond that, I think that, you know, the, the fact that society is overcorrected and now it's like you see these carnivore dieters eating excessively fatty meats covered with butter, covered with cheese, all this stuff. It's, um, yeah, I don't think it's super smart. And that's why you see people on those diets. They will lose weight initially when compared to their prior diets, which typically are the standard American diet, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but they inevitably end up plateauing until they realize that added fat, you know, like especially when in excess isn't doing anybody any favors. Yeah, I heard you reducing your amount of even like extra virgin olive oil, which obviously has a ton of amazing polyphenolic attributes, et cetera, but it's still highly, highly caloric if you're going to just dump, yeah. uh, you know, multiple tablespoons of, of extra virgin olive oil on your salad or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. And I've I've been I've been the biggest advocate for uh, extra virgin olive oil consumption. I still consume it. It's a, an amazing, wonderful food. But whereas before, I th- I kind of you know I was in, maybe a little bit indoctrinated into this idea that yeah, it's a free ride, a caloric yeah. free ride. I would just pour it on everything liberally. Um, yeah. Now I put uh, you know a teaspoon or a half a tablespoon um, into my salad, and uh, and I get all the benefits from it. It's great, but I'm not loading up on the calories. Yeah, I've also, I've also just started with like the the non fat or the low fat Greek yogurts and the low fat cottage cheeses. These things that I totally had written off for years, um, and I don't love them necessarily taste wise. Although the cottage cheese is, is okay, but um, but the low fat or no fat Greek yogurt, obviously the the protein. Uh, is off the chart, but yeah. then it also lets me add other things and, and get my calories kind of from the other elements that I might want to add to that to that yogurt, you know. So it's just you know this is the fun little <laughs> uh, petri dish style experiments that that you can get into. I love um, it. Yeah. So I'm wondering, do you take a like a big bolus of protein in the morning? And is the body more um, equipped to metabolize protein in the morning? How do you do that? Yeah, I definitely do that. And I, I'm i not as familiar with the literature on um, whether, you know, I, I think we're probably, like Dr. Gabrielle Lyon has talked about the fact that we're primed in the morning. And that, that makes sense to me that we've had this overnight fast. For me, the, ma- the major reasons why one should bolus protein f- fairly soon after one wakes up is that, you know, you go through these cycles of 
muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis. And whether or not you are um, preserving or even accruing new muscle mass um, is about being spending more time in that sort of anabolic pro-muscle protein synthesis state as compared to the muscle protein breakdown state. Um, and so, you know, this nutrition plays a major role here and particularly, specifically, the availability of muscle growing amino acids like your essential amino acids, which is what we, we talked about. And so after an overnight fast, you are in a state of muscle protein breakdown. And so getting that bolus of protein, which I like to you know aim for 30 to 50 grams of, of protein for my first meal, you're basically, you're halting that muscle protein breakdown process and you're stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So that's really important. I, I put enough effort into my workouts where I'm at this point trying to do whatever I can to optimize, you know, that effort that I put in, right? Like you don't want to leave money on the table. And yeah. so getting that high protein bolus first thing in the morning or soon, you know, like an hour after you wake up is I think really important. And we're now also starting to see uh, research mounting showing us that that first meal of the day really tends to kind of dictate your hunger pattern for the ensuing 16 hours. Mm, and yeah. we see that high protein first thing in the morning tends to lead to less hunger over the course of the day. It tends to lead to, for example, uh, less energy intake at the following meal, so lunch. Um, and so if you want to be walking around all day hungry, eating a low protein um meal for the first meal of the day. The continental breakfast seems to be a great idea. Whereas if you want to make sure that you've got your hunger levels in check so that you can focus on other things and that you're not, you know, predisposing your body to undo weight gain, you really do want to focus on, on eating a high protein breakfast. Um, super, super important. I know a lot of people enjoy skipping breakfast and then they end up in the, in the rec room or the break room or whatever at their office, chowing down on the donuts or the bagels and the high sugar coffee. That is a, that is a recipe for, Muscle catabolism and excess levels of hunger. So you really want to do stack. You really want to stack the the. If you want to stack the odds in your favor, focus on getting a thirty to fifty gram bolus of protein an hour after you wake up. Mm. And are you of this school of about a gram per pound uh, of protein? Uh, I said I should say a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. That's a more clear way yeah. of phrasing it. I think that's a little bit, I think that's a little high um, for most people. I think you could probably yeah. get away, particularly if you're overweight, you can get away with less protein. Um, you can use the, the, the general recommendation is to optimize muscle health. You want to aim for 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of, of ideal weight put into, into pounds. That's about one, that's about 0.7 grams of protein per pound of ideal weight. So, you know, if you're not terribly overweight, you can use your body weight and try to get 0.7 times your body weight every day in protein. Um, if you are very overweight, you can use your goal weight, which is a great way to approximate your uh, level of lean mass because that's really what it's about. Um, mm -hmm. You want to get that grammage of protein per pound of lean mass. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what I, I strive to get every day. But here's the, here's the caveat. If you're getting, when you are really trying to lean out and get as lean as possible, it may help to, Im to increase your protein um, even higher potentially uh, because you're at greater risk of muscle loss when you get really lean. But that's usually not a problem for most people. That's more of like a, comp you know, for com competitive uh, bodybuilders and the like. Um, but 0.7 grams per pound of body weight, I think is a great target for most people. Yeah. Are you um, a fan of supplementing with either whey or creatine or anything else for uh, muscle hyper hypertrophy? Yeah, I love both of those things. I think whey protein is incredible. It's like the highest whey protein is the highest biological value protein that exists, pretty much. Hmm. Um, it's uh, it's about ten percent leucine, which um, again, leucine is the most important. Uh, it's the necessary but not sufficient amino acid with regard to muscle protein synthesis. So again, you need all nine essential amino acids. You can't just take leucine. 
if that were the case, corn protein would actually be the best protein because it's the highest in leucine. It's kind of really? a weird, yeah. It's well, a weird factoid weird. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, corn protein is the highest in leucine of any known protein source, but it's low in all the other essential amino acids, so it's actually not ideal from a from a muscle protein synthesis standpoint. But um, but whey protein is about ten percent leucine, which is I think important to know because if you're consuming Say you're consuming 25 grams of whey protein, 10% of 25 grams is 2.5. So it's really easy yeah. to do the math. And you, need, you want about 2.5 grams of leucine per meal to hit what's called the leucine threshold, um, which, is opt, which, which is what optimally stimulates, which is what flips that switch of muscle protein synthesis and gets your body out of a state of muscle protein breakdown. But any high quality protein, so any you know beef, chicken, um, you're gonna you know so that's why you want each meal to have about 25 grams of protein, mm. if not more. And, and do you think it's important to focus on the specific amino acids, particularly obviously the essential amino acids, instead of just the kind of broader rubric of of protein? Um, you know, obviously, there's different substrates that that synthesize different molecules. I think uh, yeah. tryptophan is with serotonin, and maybe phenylalanine is dopamine, and there's some other ones. But obviously, you've talked very specifically about leucine. Should we be focusing in more on specific amino acids and, and their function? Great question. Uh, the simple answer is no. I think you know <laughs> if you're getting adequate protein, you don't have to micromanage. The one exception I would say. Um, to that answer is glycine, which is a non-essential uh, amino acid. Um, but it's only considered non-essential because we create it in our bodies, but we create very low levels of it. I think glycine is an amino acid that can be useful to supplement with, either as a free-form amino acid or by way of collagen. I think collagen is great, and collagen is one-third glycine. So... That's the one amino acid that doesn't typically, you don't typically find glycine in other whole food protein sources. So for example, like you could be eating all the beef, chicken, fish, soy that you want to hit your protein goal. But generally, because today we primarily eat skeletal muscle, which is low in glycine, you're not ingesting a ton of glycine on a daily mm -hmm. basis. So glycine is sort of the one amino acid that might be useful to supplement with, to promote collagen synthesis in the body, to support sleep. There's some data that glycine before bed can reduce sleep latency. Um, and it's also rate limiting in the, in the synthesis of actually glutathione and creatine, creatine in our own bodies. So glycine is actually, I think, really useful. But when it comes to uh, the other amino acids, I don't think it's uh, worthwhile to you know, concern yourself with micromanaging them, provided you're consuming high quality protein, which right. is, you know, animal proteins, um, for the most part. Got it. And a thumbs up on creatine. Yeah, I like creatine a lot. And I just did a, um, an interview with, I don't know if you've had him on your show, Jeff, but, uh, Darren Kando is a, he's like yeah. a preeminent creatine expert. Um, okay. he's the only one cool. I found who, you know, he's like, he literally, he's dead. He's a PhD who's dedicated his life to studying creatine. He's a great communicator. And, uh, and it's a, it's a fantastic molecule, um, particularly, uh, from the standpoint of muscular health and brain health. Um, and so, yeah, I supplement with it, not necessarily for, um, brain health purposes because your brain synthesizes all the creatine it needs is it needs, but, um, from a mus muscle health standpoint and a muscle performance standpoint, supplementing with it even beyond the creatine that you would naturally get from an omnivorous diet seems to play a role in supporting um you know performance uh and and muscle output so yeah i think it's a great supplement and um there's a lot of research now on it showing that it can play a role in supporting mental health and the like so yeah i'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a fan and it's safe it's very safe it's got a robust yeah. safety and efficacy record which is the most important aspect of it actually uh, absolutely um, so you talked about getting a big bolus of protein early in the day. I think you're a morning workout guy. So, um, so how do carbs fit into that equation 
with you and working out and are you are you taking consuming a bunch of carbs prior to a workout yeah i've 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 experimented with this and um and i really do think that for somebody who's training intensely carbohydrates really are a are a really significant performance enhancing tool to be utilized i used to train fasted and i enjoy a fasted workout you know when you're fasted you're kind of you're getting the benefit of these catecholamine hormones and cortisol because you're you're essentially fasted and so your body's like where's the food coming from and so you're in kind of you're in a mild stress state and so you get a bit of an energy boost from that um and also i would feel whenever i would have worked out prior after a big meal i would feel very heavy and very you know i'm like digesting and i wouldn't have all you know energy as much energy as i would have during a fasted workout but i think if you in, if you have a an easy to digest source of carbohydrates and protein pre-workout without much fat which slows digestion so you want again you want your you want this pre-workout meal to be primarily just carbohydrates and protein mm -hmm. it seems cool. to enhance performance and again your muscles store glucose as an energy source to be used during high intensity like resistance training and so you know you look at any bodybuilder on social media, which, you know, we're not reaching bodybuilders with this podcast, I'm sure. And certainly that's not my target audience either, but success leaves clues and bodybuilders, they know what they're doing and they're all making use of carbohydrates to support their energy in the gym. And that's a really important thing. We need to borrow from across these different fields. And, um, and so, yeah, so I've, I've started eating carbs pre-workout and um, I've even experimented with some intra-workout carbohydrates. So, you know, if I have a particularly long workout, I can fuel it by having some carbohydrates mid-workout, like a banana or something. And, um, and yeah, it, 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 my, I feel like it's improved my strength. It's it improved my endurance. And uh, anything that you can do that's going to give you more energy in the gym which essentially functions to turn up the volume on that anabolic stimulus, then that's a good thing. Because again, muscle health is so important and that stimulus is so important, particularly as we get older, right? And we risk sarcopenia as you, as you, as you alluded to. And so, yeah, I think carbohydrates are great. I'm, uh, I'm, I absolutely see the value in ketogenic diets in certain, for certain therapeutic applications. Um, and I continue to research and, and, and educate on that. But um, I, I don't think I would any longer place myself in this sort of like low carb. Like I don't, I think carbohydrates are a tool to be utilized um, and, uh, and can be really great actually when yeah. used appropriately. I, yeah, I mean, I think it's just how to leverage them intelligently like yeah. you're doing. I mean, you know, it seems that zone five or high intensity workouts, your body's preferred fuel in that particular situation is going to be glucose. It's going to be carbohydrates versus more of like a zone two. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to take a hike. Uh, your body seems to prefer or use fat more efficiently in that yeah. particular setting. So again, I think it's, you know, um, just an intelligent use of your macronutrients and, and also just a sort of a product of your own experience. I mean, how does your body feel, right? I mean, we can geek out on this stuff all day long, but you know, yeah. how do we feel? So that's another element of it that I, I think is, is significant. Um, do you think that there is a trade off in any way between performance and longevity? Hmm. That's a great question. You know, uh, people are divided on this. I don't. I think that um, by optimizing the physical health of the body and by chasing health, I think that a healthy body is going to be a body that performs well. Um, you might not get super physiologic performance, you know, but we're not talking about that. We're not, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to be a strength athlete at this age, but... Um, but by getting my body in the best shape, I think that I'm arming it for uh, the decades to come where we know that it becomes that resilience and robustness becomes crucially important to helping stand the test of time and future proof your body. Um, we know that resistance training 
is the best intervention for supporting bone health. And um, that's really important. You know, falls and, and fractures are, you know, devastating to the, to the older individual. Um, and so, yeah, I don't really think that there's much of a trade-off. I mean, you know, some people might argue that by prioritizing high-quality proteins, which are, again, animal proteins, you end up inevitably ingesting more saturated fat, which is going to predispose you down the line to atherosclerosis. But I think that the link is very tenuous at best that saturated fat drives disease. And in fact, all the newer research is really calling into question that whole connection um, and that there are other underlying factors at play. Like there is a study that showed published in 1999 in women that found that insulin resistance is really the biggest needle mover on ApoB, which is the sort of um, biomarker most closely associated with uh, atherosclerosis, it's the number of ApoB carrying lipoproteins in your blood. And that insulin resistance really dramatically, way prior to alterations in glucose homeostasis. So yeah, I'm not concerned with the consumption of animal products, provided again, you're consuming a one that, and you know, animals that have been properly raised, uh, and fed their biologically appropriate diets and that you're, and that you're taking care of your body and that you're not, you know, consuming processed foods, which are going to kick you into a state of caloric excess. Um, so no, I actually don't think that there's a trade-off. You know, we live in this anabolic growth minded culture you know, everything bigger is better almost all the time in Western culture. And, um, and we tend to be in incessant anabolic states as humans. Um, now what we're growing, we're talking about growing muscle. That's actually a healthy anabolic state, but there's also, you know, hyperplasia of adipocyte of fat cells. So, um, and you know, when I hear guys like, uh, David Sinclair, who's obviously, you know, trumpeting longevity all day. Um, you know, he's talking a lot about repair pathways so that, you know, protein, for example, is going to activate mTOR, which is, you know, this kind of anabolic pathway and inhibit AMPK and all of the autophagy and, and healthy repair functionality that's associated with that. So, you know, like, I think it's hard to kind of parse all of these things out. Um, I think there's a healthy time for anabolic activity, and then there's a healthy time for the body to repair. And I think that's why we need to focus on our sleep. I think I'm, you know, an intermittent faster, maybe three, two to three weeks a month. And, you know, whether or not you can get into autophagy after 16 hours, I don't know. There's a lot of conflicting data there, but I think it does give the body an opportunity to, you know, repair to some degree. So I think it's, you know, again, it's always finding this middle way, this balance. Um, and, uh, but I, yeah, that's just, a, I think it's an interesting, just sort of more, almost more of a philosophical question than it yeah. is a physiological question. It is. Yeah. I mean, but when, when it's about strike, you know, biology is perennially, attempting to strike a balance between anabolism and catabolism, but catabolism is the catabolism is the breaking down, right. Of, of tissues and structures. And when you ask me like where I think we should be spending most of our time, you know, and I'm not saying the, the vast majority of our time, but like breaking down entropy, that's the, that's what drives death and decay. You know, like, so I would, I would much rather personally, I mean, this is where my head is at now subject to, you know, and I reserve the right to change, but I, I do think that by, you know, we, we're all, we're in a catabolic state when we're sleeping, right? When we're sleeping, our bodies are resting and repairing, doing what they're hardwired to do from a biological standpoint. And then when I think we're awake, then I think it's about stimulating anabolism, building up the body, you know, strengthening the body. And I think that's how you win this. I mean, ultimately nobody wins, but I think that that's how, you know, you procure a long and healthy life by, I think, doing whatever you can to tilt the, tilt the scale in the favor of, you know, for as long as you can building up and repairing as opposed to breaking down and destroying. 
um, which is that anabolic, catabolic yin and yang. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, we want there. Obviously, proteins in the body become dysfunctional and misfolded. Yeah. We want to break those down into their component amino acid building blocks, such that the body can rebuild them properly. So there is a case to be made for yeah. some uh, concur intelligent catabolism, I suppose, or even yeah. mitophagy. People are talking about that now, the breaking down of dysfunctional mitochondria. But I think just as a more epidemiologically as a bigger problem, I think what we've been talking about for the last hour or so, yeah. that's where we're really, uh, we need to... We're growing the you know, wrong things. things. We're, growing, <laughs> we're growing the wrong things, exactly. So last thing, and I'll let you get go into your day. You inspired me to do this uh, project over the weekend. Um, you know, we both talk a lot about all sorts of different protocols. Um, I try to underscore that a lot of the protocols for health are free, you know, whether you're an intermittent faster or, you know, deliberate cold therapy, um, or meditation movement, you know, et cetera, you can spend a lot of money on those things, but essentially they can also just be completely free. Um, <laughs> but what is not necessarily free or what isn't free is food. Hmm. Um, and especially, you know, really high quality food and there's a million reasons why that is that's a different podcast we can talk about our food systems and all of the misaligned perverse incentives associated with our food systems that have created this surfeit of shitty calories <laughs> um but uh so just listening to your podcast for the last couple of weeks in preparation for this one i was like you know what i'm gonna go to 7-eleven and i'm gonna try to find the seven healthiest foods at 7-Eleven. Like it. if I was either traveling and, you know, I couldn't avail myself of a, you know, farmer's market or a Whole Foods, et cetera. Um, or if I lived in a food desert where so many people do and the only access they have uh, for food is like convenience store oriented food. Um, so that was my mission this weekend. I, I went and did it with a friend and, uh, I'll, I made a little spreadsheet. I'll send it to you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I know that you did something similar with McDonald's. I think you took a lot of undue heat for it because I know I where I know the intention from that, you know, where it was coming from. Can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that experiment and what you found? <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. I definitely, people thought that I was paid, that it was a sponsored thing. It wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't at all. Yeah. I gave a talk at a university and, um, one of the students, you know, students are low on money, told me he's got this hack where he goes to McDonald's and that there's a secret menu when you order a McDonald's, the, that isn't listed on the boards or whatever on the menu. And I don't know, I haven't been to McDonald's in 20 years, Yeah. but he said that you can order off of the a la carte menu and you can get um, just the burger patties. Now, I'm not saying that the meat is great. I'm not saying that the cows are treated great. I, I'm making no claims about the quality of the meat, but what I can tell you is that irrespective of meat quality, protein is protein, particularly when it comes from beef. And so I thought that was a great way when in a pinch or if you're a broke college student to get a certain amount of protein, right? And so I, on my Instagram, I did an experiment where I went through the McDonald's drive through and I ordered four uh, quarter pounder beef patties <laughs> from the a la carte menu for $8. And so right. you're getting a pound of beef. Again, I'm not, you know, I don't know where the meat comes from, but I know that, you know, people from people, I've got followers that have worked at McDonald's tell me that the, the meat is just thrown straight onto the grill. They don't use any oils. Um, it's 100% beef and you know, it's fattier than I would normally like. Cause as we've talked about, I don't, I don't think it's smart to overeat fatty meat. Um, but as a protein source, when in a pinch you're getting, I think it was like 70 grams of protein, which when I was in college, I would take road trips for fun and I would find myself on long stretches of highway where I wouldn't know what to eat. I think it's very empowering to know that you can get a pound of beef by itself without any added oils, you know, from one of these chains. And so I got a ton of heat from it. People were like, not that I care, you know, but uh, people were like, you're sponsored by McDonald's, you're supporting McDonald's. 
I'm like, I'm not doing anything of the sort. This is a hack that a broke college student told me about, and I thought it was awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I what I found at Seven Eleven, I have a whole list, but was this canned Hormel chicken for about three dollars and fifty nine cents. And granted, this is a Seven Eleven in LA, so it's probably yeah thirty forty percent higher pricing than might exist somewhere else. And, you know, this had 22 grams of protein. Um, again, probably wasn't like the, the healthiest meat. This is all industrial farmed, uh, you know, chicken, right, I, I have to imagine. Um, but, you know, from a caloric perspective, it was like, you know, 110 calories or something. It had no carbs and no added sugar. I mean, versus everything else in the store, which yeah. was like added sugar galore. So, you know, I was like, okay, you know, this is making the list. <laughs> so, Why well, is yeah. it bad? Yeah. I think that as a, as a, I mean, look, my, I, I, I care primarily about helping people feel better and get healthier. I'm not, that's why I got started in this and why I do what it is that I do. And I feel like I've, I will have failed if, if what I do is present this uh, perfectionist, impossible to attain, right. um, lifestyle where you have to be able to shop at Erewhon or Whole Foods to, you know, to eat ideally. That's not my goal. My goal is to impact population health. And so, you know, I think it's incredibly empowering to know that you can get canned chicken at 7-Eleven. I went, I was at a gas station and I found a pack in a, of canned tuna. I mean, yeah, I could pick apart and scrutinize, you know, that yeah, oh, yeah. it shouldn't be in a can with the BPA, but like, come on, you know, people are suffering and it's due to metabolic illness. It's due to excess adiposity. And you got to focus on the big rocks. You know, you can't focus on the minutia. And so, you know, the big rocks to me are making sure you're hitting your protein intake every day. Resistance training. Avoiding the ultra processed stuff. You know, that canned chicken probably had three ingredients in it, if that. That's right. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. I mean, that's totally. not an ultra processed food. It's a processed food, but it's not an ultra processed food. Right. Well, Max, uh, I love spending time with you. I love how curious you are. And I also um, love how malleable you are to new information. Um, you know, you're not dogmatic. Uh, you're just really trying to follow the highest stringent information and, um, and you apply it to yourself. You know, you're walking the walk. So I uh, really appreciate our friendship and and our time together today and, and I'm excited to have you back next year and learn more about your film oh hell yeah well thank you Jeff it's always a pleasure to get to hang with you and I look forward to our next in person hang up in Topanga for sure it's uh, always fun when we get to do that thanks for having me yeah we'll do it soon thanks man of course hey thanks for watching if you like this interview from the Commune Podcast then click subscribe and check out this video right here